this is this part of the seafood tomorrow project it was about sustainable management of shellfish production areas uh, which is kind of a broad general description that doesn't get into the meat of what we really did so the background behind why we set up the, this um, part of the project was uh, that norovirus and marine toxins are, are really some of the most important causes of shellfish related illness worldwide and, and despite public health controls outbreaks continue to occur in Europe that impact public health, consumer confidence, and producer interests. So the aim of, of this project was to try to develop predictive models for human norovirus and shellfish and for harmful algal blooms um, that could assist more targeted and, and flexible approaches to management of shellfish production areas, but then also using modeling outputs to develop a risk management protocol that would consider the implications of a dynamic buffer zone approach in shellfish production areas across Europe. So what were the actual outcomes then? So our outcomes were, we did an investigation of the suitability of a buffer zone approach to the management of bivalve shell fisheries. We undertook some modeling of norovirus and toxins to predict impacts based on specific areas in England and in Spain. Um, and then we developed a protocol for applying this information. So our study sites, we, we did two very different um, studies at sites in Spain and in the southwest of the UK. Um, the two areas were quite different in nature. Uh, one was an enclosed tidal estuary or bay um, with not very much water flow. So lot, not much exchange of, of uh, fresh water and opportunity for dilution. And we had a drowned, what's called a drowned rio, which is a drowned river valley, which is an incredibly complex and deep tidal estuary that goes very far up inland and has really strong um, water flow through. So on the biotoxin side, um, Jorge and his, um, colleagues at IRTA undertook a neural network modeling for biotoxins. So they basically used, based on a huge amount of data that they have developed for Alfax Bay, um, they undertook both classical numerical modeling and neural network modeling for each uh, algal taxon that of concern in Alfax Bay. Um, the table on the left hand, uh, the right hand side of the screen shows the taxa that they studied and the threshold concentrations that they were working with. Um, they found that the, the classical numerical models really weren't sufficiently predictive to allow forecasting uh, with any confidence. The best of the neural network models that they ran um, predicted we're very good at predicting taxon concentrations above and below a threshold of abundance one to two weeks prior to, to bloom, so to speak. So that it really was very promising at giving an initial look at how um, and when these toxins bloom so that we can have a one to two week advance notice of a significant bloom. This is really significant because it, it it's that's the first time I know of a really good um, predictor for this. It's very specific to Alfax, and, and part of the reason for that is that Alfax is very, um, has a very unique system, but they also have a lot of data to underpin this. So they've been monitoring the area for decades. They have um, monitoring runs weekly, so there's a lot, a nice dense data set to work on to do these neural network models. We found at the site that we studied in England, in, wet, or in Southwest of England, that there wasn't enough data available to feed the neural network model and train it. So it, um, it, this is a, an approach that would really be appropriate for areas that are very data rich and um, perhaps not so useful in areas that are a little bit more data poor. For the foul estuary, we undertook some numerical modeling and then also um, telemac modeling of the uh, discharge of 
a uh, CSO, which is a combined sewer overflow. So these are one of the main sources of fecal contamination, particularly in areas with a high treatment level of sewage, but um, overspills when the system is um, overwhelmed during, say, rainfall events and, and periods of very high demand. So this particular model um, looked at the dispersion of uh, a um, norovirus type particle, uh, particle through, through the estuary. Ran, running a 10 day run, we found from just one CSO, if you can see the animation that's running here, uh, the impact takes a few days to work its way down the upper estuary, but you find that actually after several tidal cycles, it really begins to impact and impulses. So it's not consistent. Um, so it's quite interesting to look at how we could actually develop a dynamic um, buffer zone around some of these pulses. This again requires some very specific types of modeling. That, that would need to be done on a site-by-site -site basis because each site will have very different characteristics. The site of input of, of contamination will be different in each. And also the underpinning hydrodynamics uh, of the area will be very different. But we were able to look at how we could establish buffer zones downstream from this outfall at Truro that might actually, assuming that the uh, there is good intelligence about when this CSO spills, that with advance notice, the industry could take um, precautions to either uh, move their shellfish above the intertidal so that they're not filtering as the plume runs by, or to um, uh, cease harvesting for a period afterwards. So we came up with a buffer zone modeling protocol. So how you would approach how to, how to model um, some buffer zones. And the first step would be to identify uh, and characterize the area. And the best place to start with this would be a sanitary survey, which should summarize all the information you need to know about uh, sources of sewage pollution, um, what uh, the flow rates are, what the volumes are, um, what or what, how many CSOs are present, what the treatment level is, because all of these parameters will feed into your model. Uh, bathymetric data, good bathymetric data is needed, um, environmental data, uh, tidal data, and, and a really good understanding of the sources and how they operate. Um, modeling can then be applied by a specialist. This isn't as easily used by industry, but it's really more applicable to competent authorities who might want to uh, use this type of approach in an area where they know that there is a, an issue or there have been previous outbreaks or there's a concern about um, sewage spills and, and sewage input into the area. So one of the other things we developed with this was a harvest prediction tool, which is based on modeling of the depuration rate. So this is how quickly shellfish get rid of uh, contaminants from McMenemy, um, in the pa uh, McMenemy's paper in 2018. Um, it allows setting of the desired norovirus threshold. We don't have firm thresholds or any sort of limits for norovirus at this point in time. So this is quite flexible, allows a target um, norovirus threshold to be set, also um, requires measured E. coli in shellfish on day one and measured in water also on day one uh, in order to run this. So it does require knowledge of both E. coli and seawater in shellfish on the start date, but again, in cases where there's some intelligence about spills and foreknowledge, these samples could be taken fairly quickly and the model run to give you a possible next harvest date. So future opportunities. It would be really good to develop further projects on this to further validate all of these models in, in different locations. So we've had a look at a drowned Rhea in the southwest of England. We've had a look at a, a, a really unique 
um, as a tidal estuary in Spain. Uh, but I think for further validation work in areas that don't conform with those two scenarios, be very useful to have a look at that. There's also an opportunity for further development of modeling for toxin prediction in wider areas. So refining the model to allow for lower detection limits, the detection limits used in, in the ALFAC study are actually higher than the detection limits that we use here in, in the UK uh, for these taxa. And also to identify data rich areas that, that could support further development of these approaches. We have some really interesting areas to study here in the UK, but the data that we required to run a neural network model was insufficiently dense. So it would be um, also useful to advocate improved data, ga data gathering in areas that do have toxins issues um, to ensure that there is dense enough data to support neural network modeling in those. And some real world testing and applicability. So actually taking these models out and applying them to real world situations and seeing whether they give us answers that are very helpful. So that's just a whistle stop tour through our part of Seafood Tomorrow. Um, I would like to thank especially um, my colleagues here at CFAST who contributed to this, uh, Carlos Campos, who actually wrote the project and, and then uh, moved on to Pastures New in New Zealand partway through, um, but also to Jorge and, and Marta Fernandez at IRTA and our colleagues at IPMA who managed this project. Antonio has done a spectacular job. Thank you.